Well, we're going to open up Matthew now. So I'd love you to um, whip out, open your Bible, whether you've got a physical one. That'd be great to have a physical one, but um, you can go on biblegateway.com or we'll also have it on the screen um, for you to follow along with. So Matthew 1, uh, verses 1 to 17. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asa, Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to, da- to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud. Abihud, the father of Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Akim. Akim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Matam, Matam, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Also reading from 2 Samuel 7, 1 to 16. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me the house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of earth, on earth. And I will provide a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home for, of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from your, all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to, su- to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house For my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, 
with floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Is there anything strange about your family? Is there anything weird about the people you're related to? Like, who is at home with you just now? Like, are you with your family uh, or with your flatmates? Uh, if you're with flatmates, you, you know, if you looked around and you had a competition with them about who has the strangest or weirdest family, who do you think would win? When Jen and I were going out uh, and engaged, uh, we had to come to terms with the strangeness of our own families. As a teenager, I, I did a lot of bushwalking and hiking and camping. I mean, what a beautiful way to engage with the natural world. But not Jen's family. The Wu family were not campers. At one point, while we were engaged, Jen's mum took me aside and, and said, I won't try and do her accent, but she said, now Richard, Jen's not into this hiking and camping thing you do. She will not use those pit toilets. She needs a proper shower. You are not gonna be able to take her camping. And I said, that, that's okay, I know I'm still keen to get married. And amazingly, we have never been camping together. <laughs> but that's okay, I'm too soft for camping anyway, I love my home bed. But you can see, um, her family background mattered. But Jen also had to come to terms with things from my background. Her family loves quality cooking, buying tropical fruit by the tray, and eating out at Yum Cha and other places. My family, not so much, especially back then. And when we were dating, Jen nearly had to call off the whole thing after she saw me trying to cook rice. Now, I didn't, I didn't use a rice cooker, I didn't use any absorption method. I cooked rice like I had been taught in my family, boiled in water for 20 minutes and then drained in a strainer. She, she kind of reacted like Uncle Roger on YouTube. She was like, why are you torturing that rice? What did that rice ever do to you for you to treat it in that way? But it was just the way I'd been taught in my family. Same with me trying to eat an, a mango for the first time at age 19. I'd never seen a mango before then. I, I didn't so much eat it as destroy it with a knife. <laughs> so that was a disaster, but my family never bought mangoes. And when I went to Yum Cha for the first time with Jen's family, I, I didn't know what to do. I put soy sauce on the pork buns. I ate the decorative orange garnish that was around. I dropped the dumplings with my chopsticks. Our courtship was not so much about romance as me surviving a series of potential deal breakers, all connected to my strange family. But all of us have been shaped by our families and our families say a lot about who we are. And in this passage in Matthew, we look at Jesus' family. What does Jesus' family say about him? And it's more important than strange habits. Jesus' family means a lot for who he is and who Jesus is for us. First of all, let's just look at what we've got here. Let's make some sense of this strange piece of writing. We're in the book of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament, the first gospel of Jesus, along with Mark, Luke, and John. And according to tradition, it was written by Matthew, who was a Jewish tax collector in Galilee. He became one of Jesus' 12 apostles and later wrote down what he witnessed about Jesus' life. And Matthew begins his book in this interesting way. Uh, he doesn't start with a funny story. There's no like overview of what's coming. It's a list of names, over uh, about 46 of them, and some of them quite strange to our ears. Salmon, who I think is supposed to be pronounced Salmon, but we were, <laughs> Asa, Zerubbabel, for example. Um, did you see what verse one calls it? It calls it a genealogy. Now, what is that? What's a genealogy? Well, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a family tree. Like a family tree is something we're more used to. It's, it's when we study genetics or royal families, we diagram out a family tree. And we've got every marriage, every kid, every generation. And we need that information for the purpose of medical history or, or figuring out who's next in line to the throne or whatever. But a genealogy is something different. It's about drawing attention to key features from a person's family background for the purpose of understanding who they are. Now, you see them in other parts of the Bible. I think they exist in other cultures as well. Uh, but a genealogy traces out just one line through time rather than a spreading family. And a genealogy can skip generations if necessary to make a point. So a grandfather or great-grandfather can be called the father of someone. Now, that was quite normal. It's, it's about highlighting key names and details. 
But yeah, it's a strange kind of way to start a book. Maybe not the most exciting way, but in a culture that values family and background, it's a perfectly good way to start. And when we remember that the Bible was ultimately written by God, we can be sure that this is the best way the gospel could have started. So before we look at the, what it means, just how does it work? What's going on here? Well, have a look in your Bibles on your page. Um, if you've got a phone Bible, that's going to be a bit hard. You can only zoom out so far. But we, what we have is a title in verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Then we have Jesus' family background from Abraham to David in verses 2 to 6. This is 14 names. Uh, we're looking about 2000 BC to 1000 BC. And this is the first of three sets of 14. Three women are mentioned here in this first set of 14. Tamar in verse 3, Rahab in verse 5, and also Ruth um, in verse 5. Then next is David to Jeconiah in verses 6 to 11. This is another 14 names, the second set of 14. There's one woman mentioned here in verse 6. That's the mother of Solomon, first married to Uriah. And we know her from the book of 2 Samuel as Bathsheba. Jeconiah in verse 11 uh, was also called Jehoiakim. You can see that in footnote C. And Jeconiah was the second last king of Jerusalem and he was taken into exile by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Uh, uh, and so this period's from about 1000 BC to 600 BC. Then we have Jeconiah to Jesus. Another 14 names, although you've got to include Jeconiah twice to make the numbers add up. Uh, but this is the third set of 14. And just one woman in this section, that's Mary, the wife of Joseph and mother of Jesus, taking us from about 600 BC to zero. And then we get the summary, the conclusion in verse 17. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile in Babylon and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Uh, a neat finish. Now, just on those numbers, there you see it's 14 times three, that's 42. 42 is also six times seven, which is worth noting because seven is an important number in the Bible that often signifies completion or perfection. So this genealogy is seven times, uh, is ju just short of seven times seven, uh, which would feel very complete. So it's a, it's a genealogy that feels just short of completion. And so even with that quick overview, I think you can see that, that, that there's, there's loaded with meaning, this ge genealogy. And just so you know, uh, there are some differences between this genealogy and the equivalent genealogy in Luke, in chapter 3 of Luke. Luke goes uh, from uh, youngest to oldest rather than oldest to youngest in Matthew. Uh, Luke goes all the way back to Adam rather than just Abraham. And Luke has Joseph's father as Heli rather than Jacob. And Luke has Jesus descended from David's son Nathan rather than King Solomon. Now, there's a few theories about why those differences are here. Um, there, you can find those theories on uh, Wikipedia or, or whatever. I think it's most likely that Matthew is focusing on a line through history that highlights kings or those who would have been king uh, had they been not in exile. Whereas Luke is more interested in getting quickly back to Abraham, Noah and Adam. And as for Joseph's father, um, it's, uh, it's possible that um, Joseph's direct biological father um, in Matthew 1.11 um, uh, may not have been uh, Jacob, but it may have been Heli as per Luke, and, and that uh, Jacob could be a grandfather or an adoptive father of Joseph. So it's kind of interesting to study, but it's not in any way proof that the Bible contradicts itself. Each genealogy is looking to achieve different things. But uh, there we have, that's a layout. Now, what does it all mean? What does Jesus' family say about him? Now, I think there's three big ideas here which we'll go through, and that is that Jesus is the source of blessing for everyone, Jesus is God's eternal king, and Jesus welcomes everyone into his family. Now, let's see how those ideas come through in these fascinating verses. Firstly, Jesus is the source of blessing for everyone. Now, how could we get that out of a, from this genealogy? Well, the key is the repetition of the name Abraham in verses 1, 2, and 17. It is strongly emphasized here that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. And what does the Bible say about Abraham? Well, it says that through one of his descendants, all nations will be blessed. The first hint of this is in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, when God first makes promises to Abraham. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. There we have all peoples blessed through Abraham. But the promise becomes even clearer in Genesis 22 after Abraham offers his son Isaac as a sacrifice to God. It says there, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. There it is. Through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. So now in this genealogy, uh, in Matthew, we're being shown that Jesus is that offspring of Abraham who will bring, bring blessing to all nations. It's taken 42 generations, but he is finally here. And as we read through Matthew, we'll see that Jesus really is bringing blessing to all people. He's healing, he's teaching, he's bringing forgiveness of sin. He is the promised one. Have you ever waited a long time for something great? It's a bit like a kid waiting 364 days until Christmas or a traveler waiting 14 days to come out of hotel quarantine. Eventually the wait is over. That's what it's like with the Israelites and Jesus. Blessing is finally here. Are you longing for blessing in your life? Many of us are deeply aware of the need for God's blessing. We're, we're groaning under the weight of things not going well in life. Mental illness, physical illness, relational breakdown, financial stress. Or we're groaning under the weight of things not going well spiritually. A lack of meaning in life, a lack of purpose a lack of hope, or a sense of guilt over things we've done, or things we can never get right. Or we just feel a distance between us and God, or a sense of disapproval and judgment from God. This is all a longing for blessing. Is that you? Well, the Bible is saying here that Jesus is the source of true blessing, just as God promised Abraham. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean instant physical healing or getting rich or suddenly getting the spouse we've always wanted, but it means that every spiritual blessing we could want, forgiveness of sin, reconciliation with God, the gift of the Holy Spirit, fellowship with his people, a hope for heaven, the hope of resurrection, Jesus brings every spiritual blessing so that even if life on this earth remains hard, believers in Jesus can have joy and hope and peace. So if you're watching this video and, and life is not not going great for you at the moment, well, you're looking in the right place. Matthew's gospel is the place to be. You need to get connected with Jesus, the source of true blessing. But this genealogy is not just about blessing. It's also showing us a second big idea and that is that Jesus is God's eternal king. Now, how do we see that from this genealogy? Well, we see it in the connection with David. Just like Jesus was a son of Abraham, he was also a son of David. David is mentioned in verse 1, verse 6, and verse 17. So who was David? Well, David was Israel's greatest king. He united the tribes, uh, he conquered the Philistines, he captured Jerusalem, he established a major kingdom. Everyone always looked back to David as God's greatest king. And at a key point in his life, David, God promised David that one of his descendants would have an eternal kingdom. The promise is in 2 Samuel 7, which we read before, but just to focus on verse 12, uh, the message was for David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. What a promise. David's regular sons and grandsons, they were kings for a few years or decades, but they all died. And some were good, some were bad, but you know, nobody was perfect. Uh, but this ultimate son of David will have an eternal kingdom established by God, perfect rule under God. God's kingdom in this view, is it's kind of like an organization that has lots of acting leaders, lots of acting leaders, like acting captains, acting principals, acting CEOs, and so on. 
nothing really happening until the permanent leader comes in. And once you get the permanent captain or the permanent principal or CEO, things actually start happening. And this prophesied son of David is like the permanent leader and not just permanent, but eternal and not just eternal, but also powerful and just and fair and good. This hope of an eternal king was the hope of Israel. And it comes up again and again in the Psalms and the prophets, the ultimate son of David, God's eternal king. And now Matthew is saying that the king is here. Jesus is the son of David. You see in verse 1, Jesus, the son of David. In verse 6 and 17, Jesus, Jesus is God's eternal king. And we see this kingship in the way Matthew gives another title to Jesus. Did you see it there? Uh, the title of the Messiah in verse 1 and verse 17. Other translations use the word Christ here, Jesus the Christ. I mean, the word is the same. It's not Jesus' surname. It is his title, and it means God's anointed king and saviour. So Jesus is the son of David. He's the Messiah. And so therefore he is God's eternal king, king over Israel and ultimately the king over everyone. And indeed, this is what we see in the Gospel of Matthew. One of the very first things in this gospel is the wise men or the magi from the east. Uh, they, they come and who, uh, who are they looking for? They're looking for the king of the Jews. And at the end of Jesus' life, what is the charge hanging over Jesus' head on the cross? It says, here is the king of the Jews. So Jesus is not only the son of Abraham, the source of blessing for all nations. He is the son of David, God's eternal king over everyone. And fascinating, these two themes come together at the very end of Matthew. In the very last verses of Matthew, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Can you see that phrase, all nations? That's a reference to God's promises to Abraham that all nations would be blessed through him. And can you see the language of kingship? All authority and obedience to every command. And this is eternal to the very end of the age. So both at the start of Matthew and at the end, Jesus is the source of true blessing for all nations and God's eternal king. So, but what does that mean for us that Jesus is God's eternal king? Well, there's a lot we could say here, but a big thing is that Jesus is in charge of your life. It's a big claim. But think about it. Like all of us love the idea of blessing from Jesus. We love the blessing Jesus brings, forgiveness of sins, hope of heaven, a sense of meaning, Christian fellowship and so on. But we don't want him to be our king. We don't want to obey his word in the Bible because all of us like being in charge of our own life. We don't want to be told what to do. We don't want to be told that we have a king whose every command we must obey. Now, for some of us, that's a brand new thing. Like you might be watching there, you think well, that, that would mean a radical change to let Jesus be in charge of your life. You might want to resist it. And you might want to stay in charge, but really this is not a negotiating point with Jesus. He's the king, whether you fight back or not. And anyway, Jesus is a better king than us. So really, why would we resist? Why, why would we let our pride overrule our common sense here? For other of us uh, watching on, this idea is familiar. We know Jesus is king, but this is still contested territory. Jesus is sort of our king as much as we can get his blessing, but a lot of the time we stay in charge and, and disobey his commands. His commands are kind of like a unread emails in our inbox. We're aware of them, they sit there, they bank up, but they have no impact on our lives. Friends, that is not sustainable. Blessing and obedience, they're two sides of the one coin. Receiving God's spiritual blessings means absolute obedience to God's king. So if there are areas in your life where you know you are disobeying Jesus, uh, sexual sin, for example, or, or greed or hatred, um, you must change. You must start obeying Jesus here. He will win out in the end. And, and you can be either on good terms or bad when that time comes. For he is God's eternal king. Now, before we get to our third point uh, here, I just want to take a quick tangent into this third set of the genealogy uh, that starts with the exile to Babylon in verses 11 and 12. 
Like that moment seems to correspond with Abraham and David as key moments, but what does it actually mean? Now we know that in, in uh, 596 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon carried off King Jeconiah uh, into um, uh, exile, also known as Jehoiakim. Um, it took with him various princes and officials. Uh, and at that time, the, um, and a few years later, the city of Jerusalem and the temple, they were kind of ransacked and destroyed and damaged. Uh, it was a shameful low point in Israel's history. The Old Testament prophets explained it as God's judgment on the sinful nation of Israel. So God let it happen or, or he made it happen. His precious people were handed over to the Gentiles as punishment for sin. But why would Matthew focus on it here? Well, this is what I think. I think in Matthew's gospel, Jesus often traces or retraces the history of Israel in his own life. Like um, Israel went to Egypt, Jesus goes to Egypt. Israel went through water in the Exodus, Jesus was baptized in water. Israel was tested in the desert, Jesus was tested in the desert. He repeats Israel's history in miniature. But was Jesus ever exiled to Babylon like Israel? No, but Jesus was handed over to Gentiles, the Romans, as God's punishment for sin. Just as Israel was led out to Babylon, Jesus was led out by Roman soldiers to be crucified on a hill just outside the city. And was this for his own sins? No, Jesus was sinless. Jesus suffered in this way for our sins. So the genealogy in chapter one, I think, is hinting that an exile kind of suffering is coming for Jesus. It's going to be part of Jesus' story. And this is helpful for us to see because it shows us the kind of king we are submitting to. This is the king that we must obey. He's a king who loves us so much that he has died for us to save us from sin and death and hell. His death secured for us the blessings promised to Abraham, including the forgiveness of sins. So isn't that good? Please come to this king, to Jesus who loves us. His loving sacrifice for us has secured every spiritual blessing. But that's a brief tangent on the exile in this genealogy, but we want to come back to the last main point from it, uh, from the genealogy, and that is that Jesus welcomes everyone into his family. Now, how do we get that from the genealogy? Well, I mentioned the five women in, in this uh, list. Uh, they're, actually, they're, they're put there deliberately. I often, um, I read that often in Jewish genealogies, um, if you're going to mention women in the genealogy, you would mention the great ones, uh, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, maybe Leah. Uh, these are wives and mothers from honorable families. But the women in Matthew's genealogy, well, what do we know about them? Tamar, in verse 3, was a Canaanite woman, a, a foreigner, uh, who had sex with her father-in-law to have children. Rahab, in verse 5, was a Canaanite sex worker in the city of Jericho. Ruth, in verse 5, was a Moabite woman who came to Bethlehem as a refugee. Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, in verse 6, may well have been a Hittite woman like her husband. She was a victim of David's sexual abuse and a living reminder of his adultery and his murder of her husband. And Mary, in verse 16, is an unmarried mother, um, unmarried and pregnant in a traditional society. All of these women, uh, especially the first four, were outsiders in Israel. Some of them had a shameful past. But despite that, Matthew highlights them here. Now, why is that? Well, it's a way of saying that Jesus is starting a spiritual family where everyone is welcome. Now, would you, really, you might say a new spiritual family? Well, let me explain with three more clues. Firstly, the genealogy itself sets up the expectation of a new family. There are six sets of seven, three times 14. Where is the final seven? Where are the descendants of Jesus? The genealogy is forward looking. It makes us look for the next generation. The second clue is that Jesus calls people who believe in him, his spiritual family. In Matthew 12, it says this, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So there's a new family here that is not tied to biology. 
And then the third clue, the women in this genealogy are like some of the people who will believe in Jesus during the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, a Roman centurion, a foreigner in chapter 8. A Canaanite woman in chapter 15. Various tax collectors, sinners and prostitutes. Jesus, his new family, it looks like a, a lot like his old family. So because of these three clues, I, I think the genealogy is saying that Jesus welcomes all people into his spiritual family. If Jesus' family was a house, uh, it would have the, the front gate open. The front door would be open. The mat with the welcome written on it would be there. And Jesus would be there in the front yard to personally welcome you in. And I reckon uh, some of us really need to hear this. We're coming from very confusing backgrounds. We don't fit the stereotype we imagine Christians to be. Middle class, nuclear families with everything together. We come from broken families or we come with a, with a complex past of, of suffering and shame. Uh, we're dealing with addiction or crime in some way or all kinds of sin. We might think that Jesus brings blessing, sure, uh, and he's the king, great, but there's no way there could possibly be a place for me. I'm not the kind of person Jesus is looking for. But that's not true. If there's a place for Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, there is a place for you. You're exactly the kind of person Jesus is looking for. Jesus will welcome you into his family. So please come today and accept Jesus' invitation. And for those of us who are already in Jesus' family, we need to have the same mindset as Jesus here and welcome all people. I'll just highlight a couple of ways for this. Uh, if you're, you're watching online, um, let me sh tell you, look, we would love to see you back in person at church next week. Each week, we've got new people turning up who need to be welcomed. We've got people from all kinds of backgrounds coming along. People who are not yet Christian, international backgrounds, various education levels, you name it, all kinds of people. We need you to help welcome them. Jesus needs you to help welcome them. At some of our congregations at the moment, we're probably only getting about six out of 10 regular members coming along each week. And I know sickness is a factor and there's, there's various things, but I think that kind of proportion is too low. And it means people are missing out on your welcome. So please come back to church in person and join us in welcoming people in Jesus' spiritual family. And just one more thing, I think this welcoming nature of Jesus uh, is what actually compels us to reach our whole region with the message of the gospel. Let's just take the city campus, for example. The city campus coming up um, in, the next, uh, in the next year or so. Are we doing this to be big and influential? Are we doing this to be respected in the church world as engaging with urban culture? No, that's not it at all. We are wanting to extend Jesus' welcome to everyone in the city area of Newcastle. We want to extend that welcome to students, to young couples, to retirees, uh, people who may not have, not have any knowledge of Jesus, people sleeping rough, people with addictions, people with mental illness, people from the LGBTQI community, immigrants, refugees. We're planting a campus in the city so that we can reach all people. And in the lead up to this, we want some of you to think about playing your part in this new plant. Can you come to church on a Sunday uh, in town? Can you come in one day a week to sit and have coffee with people? Can you run a small group in town? Can you, can you help us run an evangelistic ministry in there? Because we want to be like our king and welcome everyone into his spiritual family. Well, what have we covered today as we've looked at this strange genealogy? Well, we have seen that Jesus' family tells us a lot about him. He is the source of true blessing. He's the eternal king. He welcomes everyone into his spiritual family. And all these big ideas mean heaps for us. What will it mean for you this week? What needs to change for you this week? Do you need to come to Jesus for blessing, perhaps for the first time? Do you need to stop ignoring the commands of Jesus and actually obey him as your king? Do you need to start coming regularly to church? Well, don't ignore this opportunity to respond to God's word. Uh, let's pray for that change now. So please pray with me. 
Our Father in heaven, all of history is in your hand. You worked through all these generations to get to the point when Jesus, the Messiah, came to earth. He is the source of all blessing for us, and we praise you for that. He is your eternal King. May he be our King, and may we obey him in everything in our life. Thank you that we have been welcomed into his spiritual family. Give us a heart to welcome others. We are sorry for the ways we have failed and sinned in so many ways. Thank you for the forgiveness of Jesus, won for us at the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.